Is there synergy in audio cables and interconnects? That's the question I want to answer in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasalo with Audioholics. So this is a topic I've been wanting to talk about for a while and it kind of got nudged to talk about it when I saw PS Audio doing a whole video about how they discovered cable synergy between AudioQuest and their products. So it got me thinking, is there any possibility to this claim? Is there any validity to this claim? Is it a good thing to have synergy between cables and the components that they connect with? So when you try to think about this logically and not get too involved in the technical, because I could certainly go down that road, but I want to do logic for a minute. In order to imply that a cable has synergy, to me, it means that it acts like a tone control. Because I don't think any audiophile would, agree, would disagree with the fact that if you say the ideal cable is a superconductor, it's no cable. It has no losses. It has no resistance. It has no inductance. It has no capacitance. That's the ideal cable. So if you connect two pieces of equipment with an ideal cable, there's no synergy. So the only time you can have synergy with a cable is if the cable's really bad. If it has a lot of capacitance for an interconnect, it can cause problems. It could cause roll-offs. If it has a lot of inductance and resistance for a speaker cable, it could cause insertion loss and high frequency roll-off. But the reality is, any decently designed cable that literally costs dollars per foot, when I measure them on an audio precision, when I measure them with a Wayne Kerr analyzer to characterize them, we're talking tenths of a dB differences between a good cable and a superb cable. So do you really wanna have a cable that acts like a tone control that could alter the sound that can change your highs or change your lows? In my opinion, the best place to put a tone control is in your processor and preferably in the digital domain. You wanna do all your frequency response manipulation digitally. You really don't wanna use analog. And I think most audiophiles would agree they don't even wanna use tone controls in their dedicated two channel preamps when they connect their turntables, right? They put all those tone controls on flat or they use the bypass. So why would you take a cable and now use that as a tone control. It makes no sense to me. So let's just forget that argument for a minute. The other possibility would be the fact that the interface equipment is faulty. In other words, they didn't design their amplifiers or their preamplifiers very robustly to be able to handle a wide variety of cables. So they have to have a very special magic cable that makes them sound best. Any good amplifier designer will tell you the ideal amplifier has an infinite input impedance and an infinitely low output impedance. That shouldn't be the case. If you designed good buffer stages in your amplifiers, they shouldn't be picking up tons of noise. They shouldn't be causing frequency response changes when you change the cable. I mean, it's just good amplifiers, good preamplifiers, good DACs. They don't change their response much. If you measure the transfer function when you connect two pieces of equipment, they should be very similar if you have a decent cable. We're talking dollars per foot cable, okay? That should not change much. And I wanna just show you a couple of things here. When I was a design engineer doing telecom, I designed very sensitive equipment. I designed stuff that went into the battle planes um, where we could order nuclear strikes from, the president can. And I had to design uh, isolation requirements that I can't even talk about on here to give you the specifics. But I could measure things really precisely. I had to go into RF anechoic chambers to do these kind of measurements. And we never had special cables with batteries slapped on them. We never had special cables that were interwoven with each other with special fancy dielectrics. We used common cables that are in engineering textbooks. And in fact, I used this textbook by Henry Ott to help me mitigate noise in digital and analog systems and to have the best kind of connectivity, whether it was through the board traces, through PWBs, or connecting uh, equipment, source and transceiver equipment when you had to do impedance matching, it's all in here. 
And if you look at this book and it shows you the ideal cable out to a couple of gigahertz is a standard coax, double foil, double braided coax, RG6. I use RG6 throughout my house. I have two miles of RG6 in this house. I transmit all of my video up to 1080p through RG6. I transmit all of my audio between my equipment using RG6. I use Belden 1694A. It's 18 gauge, so it has very low loss. It could go hundreds of feet if you have to. Doesn't pick up noise. I prefer coax cable over twisted pair personally because it has better noise immunity if you have a bunch of cables located next to each other. And you have the characteristic impedance of 75 ohms if you need it. When you do digital interface circuits, you do need to match characteristic impedance. Characteristic impedance is not even something you have to worry about for analog interconnects or speaker cables. And I could do a whole separate video on that. I don't wanna go down that path right now. So we have the book that tells us coax is all you need for DC all the way up to a couple of gigahertz. Now figure, re realize this for a minute. We're talking about 50,000 times the bandwidth of audio frequencies, yet somehow the audio industry for consumer audio has many audiophiles tricked into thinking you need a special cable property that only happens from 20 kilohertz and below. Everything above 20 kilohertz, you could use this book. You could use standard engineering practices that have been in place for over 100 years. But audio somehow, consumer audio, has the monopoly on knowing something that engineers don't. So let me put this book down for a minute. I want to show you something else interesting. When I do very precise measurements on amplifiers using my audio precision, I use what audio precision recommends. This is RG59. This is 75 ohm coax. It's got a BNC on one side. It's got an RCA on the other. Now I could do measurements down to minus 120, minus 130. If you have the really expensive audio precision two channel device, it could go down to about 140 dB. That's way better than any of these equipments that people are buying. Most audio consumer grade equipment cannot measure as well as our test gear that we're using to measure it with, okay? There's very few exceptions. And I could tell you that this is the cable that we're using for it. This is what Audio Precision recommends. If you're doing balanced cables, we use shielded cables, twisted pair shielded. Um, for digital cables, you use a Mogami. That's just a brand that Audio Precision recommends, 110 ohm. Nothing magical about these cables. You just need good shielded cable and you need a good characteristic impedant cable if you're doing digital measurements. For my speakers, when I hook up a speaker load or I hook up a resistor load for measuring power and amplifiers, I'm using 10 gauge. I'm using this Belden cable that Blue Jeans cable sells. It's 500 TUP. I don't even remember the model number, but I have this all through my house. I wired up my entire system using um, 10 gauge zip cord because this has very low resistance. It has very reasonably low inductance and very low capacitance. This is very transparent. Now, what I find interesting is all of these companies like PS Audio, for example, PS Audio has a bunch of engineers on staff. They make beautiful components. They make excellent amplifiers. I've never measured them, but they look like they're state of the art. They make great DACs. There's a ton of people that love their equipment. I would love to kind of measure some of their stuff. I'm sure it measures great. They're using this type of cabling when they're doing their precise measurements. Yet somehow these cables are good enough to do their delicated measurements, these delicate measurements, but they're not good enough for playback when you're plugging your system in and you're doing listening. Why is that? Why is that, I ask you? That doesn't make any sense to me. How could we do precise measurements that only require these kind of cables but we need some fancy cable that you slap a battery on or you name it Diamondback or you name it Silverback or you name it Mongoose, whatever you want to name it. For some reason, when it's playback, you have to have these fancy cables. And I'm just not buying that. So I asked PS Audio and they, they were very nice to me. They were very cordial. I sent them the article that I wrote about this whole topic and we did a little Q&A session. You can look down below. I'll link up the, the um, article. And I asked them, I go, how did you determine, how did you figure out that you had the best synergy with AudioQuest cables and not some other brand? How did you know what cable worked best with what component? Because they claim Paul McGowan was dancing around 
claiming that he found the magic cables that went with each of his components from AudioQuest. How did you determine that? And their response was listening tests. Listening with their ears. No objective measurements, no way to quantify it, no way to figure out, hey, this is where we reach the point of diminishing returns. There was just no way. And that bothers me because if you're only gonna rely on a listening test, especially if it's a sighted listening test, you could fall victim to placebo effect. And that's why if you do any type of controlled listening test, they have to be blind. And most of the audio community, when it comes to these snake oils of cables or it comes to these mods that you put on your equipment, they never wanna have a blind listening test because that will remove the biases that they don't wanna to admit to that they could be subjected to. Everybody is subjected to biases. I'm subjected to biases. If I'm gonna do any type of delicate comparisons between two products and the audio differences are very small, like a cable, for example, or a DAC, you really need to do those tests blind. Otherwise you're fooling yourself. If you see what's going on, if you know what's being switched, you're gonna already be biased, whether you like it or not, whether you admit it or not, there's gonna be a bias. So this, for someone to tell me they just use their listening test with no controllability there, with no objectivity there, that gives me pause for concern. And how do they know that AudioQuest is the magic cable? AudioQuest publishes no specs on any of their products, no measurements, much like Bose does with speakers. They don't produce measurements on their products. That camp of measurements don't matter, our ears, we listen with our ears. That's not good enough, in my opinion. It's not good enough for loudspeakers. Would you buy a loudspeaker you had, with the exception of Bose, because people still buy Bose, and more power to them if that makes them happy? But would you buy, would you go and spend 10 grand on a Revel speaker if you didn't know how it measured? Why would you want to not know how this thing measures in a room, what kind of output you're gonna get, how's it gonna respond off axis, I mean, Harman spends a lot of resources into accurately measuring loudspeakers in an anechoic chamber using spinorama, all that stuff. We do the same thing. We measure speakers outside. We get very precise measurements and consistency so you know how that product could have performed. Would you buy an amplifier if you didn't have any specs on it? You know, everybody comes down hard on receivers because they say, oh, it can't meet its power spec, all channels driven. Well, okay, I agree with that. We should know the power that a receiver can drive, but we should also know how a cable measures. How could you go and spend 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand on cables with no measurements? And if a company tells you the measurements don't matter, doesn't that set up another red flag to you? Because if the measurements don't matter, then how can you have synergy? And I argue that synergy is not a good thing. And I'm, I'm guaranteeing if people at PS Audio are watching this video now, and I hope they are, there's some fine folks that work there, um, the engineers that make their incredible equipment. I'm sure that they would agree with me that you don't want to have synergy in cables because that either tells you that the cables are a tone control or there's a problem with the interfaces on their own products. To me, it sells their product short because it looks like they make great components. So what I'm thinking is there's not so much synergy in the cables. Maybe they're being diluted because they're sighted listening tests. Or maybe they realize that they left money on the table when they sold their $10,000 amplifiers or their $5,000 DACs, and they probably got flooded with questions, what cable should I use with these products? So they have a good partnership, I'm sure, with AudioQuest. They get along with them. Let's face it, AudioQuest cables are beautiful. I mean, I want to believe in the voodoo and the magic and the, and the snake oil in them as well. That little battery light looks cool. But at the end of the day, is it truthful? Is there cable synergy? Is there any merit to it? Or is it just marketing BS? And that's always been my sticking point in this industry, why I've been doing pursuing the truth in audio for 20 plus years, okay? I don't have a problem with the prices that companies charge. In fact, I would love to measure AudioQuest cables. I, I'm sure they might measure well. I would like to measure them on my, pro, on my Wayne Kerr analyzer. I would like to see when I click that battery on and off if I see any differences. I can measure them. I have all the right equipment to measure them. I have all the right tools. I got my audio precision to measure differences in amplitude response. I've got my Wayne Kerr analyzer to measure the RLC, to measure the characteristic impedance, everything. I could do all of it. 
And I still have a challenge out to all these exotic cable vendors. Submit me your products. Pay me to measure your products and you can use my measurements on your website. Then you could have third party verification and we could stop with the snake oil stuff. Because I really truly believe that this synergy comment that people have been talking about with cables is much like many of the other myths, whether it's wire directionality or cable break in. There's so much nonsense. And I don't want to, I don't know, I don't want to keep doing these videos. I'm sure people are getting tired of them, but it just seems like these topics keep coming up. And it seems like you guys respond. We get views on these, on these videos. Sometimes we get more views on these videos than when we do a tech video on HDMI or we do a tech video on speaker directivity. I would rather top, you know, discuss the topics that matter most, but it seems like we keep coming back to cables. I would rather talk about the things that really matter in terms of getting better fidelity in your room. It's better for you. It's better for me. It's better for them. But the show will continue as long as the myths propel, as long as companies come out claiming things that aren't provable, I will continue to do these videos. And I'll leave you with Hitchum's razors again. Anything that can be submitted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So think about that for a minute. They offer us no measurements in their products. They offer us no objective testing to determine how they come up with synergy. So is synergy real? Do we need to prove it's real or do we need to prove it's fake? I don't really need to prove anything because they've given us no proofs that it's real. And I'm just telling you my thoughts on this whole topic. So I think we're done here. I don't want to have a target on my back. I will like to say, I, I want to thank PS Audio for participating in my article, for allowing me to quote them. I think Paul McGowan's an interesting fellow. Um, I like his vibe I, he gets from his channel. Um, he's a guy that's been in the industry longer than me, so he must have some really cool stories about audio. He's the kind of guy I would love to sit down at a bar and have a couple of beers and talk audio with. I just find that kind of stuff fascinating. But I do call out snake oil. And it's nothing personal. I think the guys at PS Audio are extremely cordial in all the dealings I've had with them. The guys at AudioQuest are extremely cordial. They've allowed me to reprint pictures of their products and to debunk their products. They've never given me a hard time. And that speaks volumes for the people that work at these companies. So I say give them a shout up or a thumbs up on that. But let's get rid of this nonsense, guys. If you want to charge a lot of money for jewelry, for audio jewelry, hey, whatever, what people want to spend is fine. I mean, I run 10 gauge throughout my house, but I still have Kimber cable on my main reference speakers for RBH. Why do I have Kimber cable? I'll tell you why. Number one, they measure as good or better than 10 gauge. They measure a little better. They have lower inductance, lower resistance, a little bit more capacitance. They look way better than this standard white cable that I get from blue jeans. And quite frankly, I like the guys at Kimber. We have a good partnership with them. When I asked them to, to supply me some cables for the system so I could do the review of the system with the cables, they said, sure, whatever. So that's why I use these exotic cables. Plus I like the terminations. I like the, uh, the compression plugs. I just love that stuff. I like making a good solid contact. Sometimes the uh, cheaper connectors just don't do that for me. So I hope you guys found this video useful. I hope I didn't preach too much. Why don't you tell me what you think about this whole topic of audio synergy? Do you think it's real or do you think it's just a way to, to merge two companies that make upscale products? It's a good way to increase your margins and a good way to do the sale. So people, when they ask you what I should use with what, they have a formula there based on budgets. Press the button in the shopping cart and you're done. So anyways, if you like this video, thumb it up. Please subscribe. Don't forget our, about our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.